Buongiorno a tutte e a tutti. Uh, good morning everybody. I'm very happy today to uh, we are very honored and uh, uh, very glad uh, to have with us today Renzo Martins. Uh, and uh, it will be a special lesson for our students because uh, they will have the occasion to speak directly with you today. And uh, it's a special occasion also because it's the uh, uh, first step of the collaboration with the Schermo dell'Arte. And uh, we have Silvia Lucchesi with us and uh, Francesca Colasante, I don't see Francesca, uh, from uh, Teatrino di Palazzo Grassi. And uh, you have been yesterday at Teatrino to see uh, the White Cube film by Renzo Martens that will be the topic of our discussion today uh, with him. But before starting, I would like to ask Silvia, uh, first of all, to thank uh, Silvia for uh, the possibility to create this connection uh, between uh, Teatrino di Palazzo Grassi and Schermo dell'Arte. Ah. Ecco. So I, I, can, I can't uh, restart, but is it, is it open? No, 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 it's, it's over there. It's over there. So um, I will leave the floor to Silvia Lucchesi uh, to tell us uh, something about Schermo dell'Arte. We spoke with the student yesterday about this important uh, uh, project that, is, get, that was born in 2008 in Florence, but it's traveling around, and that's why we are here in uh, Venice too. Thank you so much, uh, Pier Sandra. Thank you again, Renzo, for being here. Thank you to Palazzo Grassi and especially Francesca Colasante for, for this meeting today here at the uh, university. And we are very happy because it, it's not so frequent for us to get out the cinema theater and go in another place li like a, a university and meet directly our public because we we love to have contacts with students and the, the young generation. This is, this is very important for us too, so thank you again. And Luscan Modellate, as Pier Sanda just said, it's a project that was born in Florence in 2008. And now this year we, we will uh, have our 15th edition. And it's a festival on uh, cinema and contemporary art. Uh, we screen films m uh, real uh, realized by artists, but also documentaries and contemporary art uh, during the festival that takes, in, takes place in November, uh, every November in, in Florence. Uh, but also we have other projects dedicated to the young generation of artists working with moving images. And uh, uh, th these are residency um, projects, training projects. Um, so we have organized uh, uh, exhibitions showing uh, young generation production with, with moving, moving images, and we have also contributed to the production of their works. Uh, I want, because of the terrible times we are living now, I want to mention that last year, for example, we, in the exhibition we exhibited a, um, a video by a couple of Ukrainian artists uh, really very good work and actually uh, they got the first prize because uh, uh, there is a, an acquisition prize linked to the exhibition every year so they, they got the, the prize and so uh, I like to mention this because we are in touch with them right now and they, they left volunteer for the war so we, we are terribly touched about it their personal story and, uh, and the story that we are living around us. Ciao, Malvina. Hi. Uh, so, uh, more information about Lo Schermo dell'Arte uh, you can see on our website. Uh, we, we have also um, a special offer for participating for uh, students to our screenings online because the festival since 2020 has a double format on, in presence and online. So we present film, films on, the, on a platform, screening platform. So the, there is an, um, a promotion for, for seeing the films uh, dedicated to the students. So if you, um, if you follow us uh, through our website, you will be uh, informed by the next uh, 
festival, next programs and next uh, uh, projects we are, we are trying to do with the students. So I thank you so much and I leave you to the, I, I, I guess, a very interesting talk uh, between uh, Renzo and Tersandra. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sinka. Thank you very much. Um, ciao, Renzo. Ciao, ciao. I'm very <laughs> happy to have the chance to talk with you and we are very glad. Uh, our student went, uh, have been yesterday at the Teatrino, so they saw the, the, the film, and I would like to remember that today at six o'clock there is uh, uh, the previous film, uh, Enjoy Poverty, um, that was realized, uh, presented in 2010, and uh, I will um, um, ask you to, to, to see the second film, but it, I think it would be interesting to say something has started from Enjoy Poverty. But, but before doing this, um, uh, I would like um, Renzo um, going back to the episode one. Um, you realized, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly when, in, two th in 2000. It was filmed in 2000, yes, and the film yeah. was ready because I'm slow in 2003. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, it could be a good starting point today related to what we are experiencing yeah. uh, these days because the project was uh, strictly re related to the, the war, yes. representation of the war, the war. As always in your uh, work, that is, we might say, quite controversial. Um, it's always... Uh, uh, it deals always with uh, uh, critic, criticism, uh, representation, presentation, uh, and uh, uh, the possibility to see uh, the world from another point of view that can be uh, an occasion to reverse the gaze. And uh, so I, I would like to, have to, to ask you to tell about this project, so episode one that is the first um, the first moment in which you conceived, uh, probably, um, this possibility to work inside the, the art world with uh, uh, this, uh, let's say, controversial, contradictional, and uh, paradoxical gaze. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me, uh, uh, all the people that work together to invite me and my wife. Uh, Lisa, uh, so thank you, Sylvia, for uh, it's the second time you show work, or the third time, really, and your poverty was shown in our white cube, and thank you for having me at the university, and thank you, Palazzo Grazzi. Um, I'm also happy to be here, um, and thank you for having come, at least some of you, yesterday to the screening. So, indeed, it, it's kind of um, uh, a long time ago, it's 22 years ago that I made uh, the, the recordings for what then later became the film episode one. And it was filmed in Chechnya. Uh, Chechnya at the time was in some ways similar to Ukraine now. Um, it was, uh, um, a, 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 there are also important differences of course, but some similarities are that it was part of, uh, in Chechnya's case, the Russian Federation, so what we know as Russia and it was a breakaway republic within Russia. This, of course, is different than Ukraine, but uh, what the big similarity is that uh, the Russian army came uh, with massive force and um, bombed and destroyed the capital city of Grozny. Um, so at the time, in 2000, this is pre-9-11, which was in 2001, um, uh, this was the most mediatized war at the time. In that particular, it was after the Yugoslav Wars, it was before, let's say, Afghanistan and New York. So at the time, it was the most mediatized war. Um, and um, I had been thinking a little bit, uh, uh, not too much, but just enough. And I had read a few things. Um, I, I was uh, studying Foucault mostly, and I was studying uh, Baudrillard, of course, and things like that. Um, and. Um, and I thought that uh, there was a very crucial... Does everybody understand me? Do I speak too fast or not clear enough? It's okay? Yes. So I thought that uh, there was a... a within the, the, the representations of war, 
on TV, in newspapers, but also in film festival, film, film festivals, documentary film festivals, and also in art. You know, just uh, prior to that, in um, 2000, was Okui and Wezor's very important uh, documenta, 11, and, uh, or that was in 2002, excuse me. Prior to that, in 1997, there was Catherine David's uh, documenta and then Okui's. So these were two very important documentas in which the world was opened, in a way, for art. It was no longer just, let's say, New York, Milano. It was the whole world. And, of course, also the labor conditions and the big inequalities that are present in this world became subjects of documentary films and art in, in those two uh, very significant documentas. Um, uh, but what I thought is that in all of these rep different representations of war in different media, from print journals to documentas, there was one crucial position, I thought, that was missing in those representations of war. And that crucial position, in my mind, was a position of the viewer of that war. We know that many wars are fought not just on the ground with bombs or Kalashnikovs or with food aid. A big part of war is the fight that is fought around public opinion around the world. It's the fight, how do you get in the media? Which story is going to survive in the media? Which narrative is going to become the dominant narrative? You could almost say that the main battlefield of war is not the one let's say, in this or that area with the bombs and the refugees. Of course, that's all real. I'm not saying it's not real. It's very real. But the main fight is the fight on the opinion of the viewer. That's the main fight, the opinion of the viewer. Not just one viewer, but millions of viewers, and especially those viewers who have economic or political power. So who can... And, and uh, so th a big part of war is who can dominate the narrative about that war, who can dominate the story. So obviously war, to some degree, is addressed at a viewer. Stories are being created. And I thought, this viewer has an agenda for her or himself. I know I have an agenda for myself. In the morning I look on Facebook and I look, well, what happened in Ukraine? Or, um, uh, and of course I feel sympathy and empathy and I think, God, it's very complicated. I don't really understand. But then I go do something else. So the imbalances, the power um, uh, inequalities between people in war who desperately, in many cases, desperately want to get their stories out, to want to be heard or seen on the one hand, and then on the other hand, viewers, global viewers, who want to see those things, to basically understand their world a little bit better, to have a better understanding of their own position in life also. This power relationship is hardly ever um, investigated in images of war. We are not just neutral observers. We are all part of it somehow. We are, again, part of the battlefield. And I thought, this is all introduction, I thought, that what I wanted to do is to impersonate, to embody quite literally the position of the viewer in that war. So I went to Chechnya and it was complicated, as now it would be complicated, to Ukraine. I, I had no, no official papers, uh, so I had some people ma like forged papers, like fake papers, and I learned some Russian and I had a little bit of money, some true friends, and I quit my job, and I bought a little camera, and I went to Chechnya. Um, and then I made this film, in which, again, I put myself as a viewer in the middle of the war. And I, so I don't really ask, like, oh, why this, and why the rebels, and why the, the Islamic terrorists, or why the Russian terrorist uh, army, or why the kids dead, or... I mean, all of this is there anyway. But the main question is, what do you think people in war, from rebels to terrorists to uh, children dying to Russian soldiers to all the different actors of war, I ask them to reflect on me as their consumer. 
because that's what we are. We are consumers of war and inequality. So that's, that's what I did. I tried to position myself as a representative of those viewers, of those consumers, in the middle of that war, to figure out what ultimately really the relationship is, to expose that relationship. That was my goal. And so we can say that the position of the viewer, the position of the spectator and the gaze of the spectator is uh, exactly one pivot point, uh, pivot element of your research. We can recognize this statement in each of the, um, the works you presented in the, the last decade. And uh, um, related to this uh, episode one, I would like to ask you, uh, because you said uh, I embodied the, 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 the position of the viewer, uh, what did you learn about the war and the way the narratives can um, tell us about what's going on, how the, the people is uh, living under the bombs and uh, because you were inside the, the, the war, no? What did you, yeah. what, what is, uh, uh, what do we, uh, lose uh, in the narratives, in the narration? The only thing, the narratives and the narration of people living under bombs and this and that, they are covered by mainstream media um, or by interesting films. I mean, this is what is not lacking. People do that. If you, of course, it's never complete and there is always an agenda, like, do you listen to the poor Russian soldier who is sent to war and doesn't want to fight? Or do you listen to the general who wants to make a career? Do you listen to, in, in, in selecting which stories are going to be uh, put into the world, obviously you already create uh, a story of who is worthy of sympathy and who is not. But these stories are out there. The only thing, again, that I wanted to investigate was the position of the viewer. So I'm not an expert at all on what people in wars think about war. Uh, I, 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 in a way, that was not my, my, my goal to find out. I wanted to find out how people feel about their viewers. Yeah. And, um, and I wanted to analyze in a way how I feel about being a viewer um, and, and, and that is um, yeah, it, it's an analytical exercise to a large degree yeah it's, uh, it's interesting the connection you, uh, you made between the position of the viewer that is a general position but at the same time you um, recall the idea of embodiment Yes. And so I would like to ask you, how you, do you uh, um, combine these two things? Because uh, if I think about, about enjoy poverty, and I ask you if, if you can uh, tell um, us about this project a bit, and uh, because we are going to see it today, uh, I saw it already, but I would like to ask you to tell about yes. this a bit. But, um, of course, your position in that case, uh, also in the case of White Cube, is not neutral. I mean, it, it uh, uh, embodies a specific point of view. Uh, so which kind of viewer are you testifying? I'm, I'm, a, I'm exactly the type of viewer that I am, which is a, a white, male, heterosexual, middle-class, northwestern European man. That's what I am, and that's what I embody, which up to recently was seen as neutral, which of course is not neutral. But um, it, it was, it, it's the viewer for whom those stories are being created. They're, they're, they were the dominant uh, power in creating stories, so I'm, I'm that viewer. And I think you are completely right, it is not neutral, but I do try to embody it as good as I can. So. Um, so I, I think it's it somehow, especially in Joy Poverty, but also episode one, um, they, yeah, they spill the beans, they, they, they reveal the secret of, I think anyway, of, of how the privileges of some people on this planet are 
part of the destitution of other people on this planet and how the inequality between the two is not just because of economic production chains, that is for sure. I mean, I mentioned yesterday that my clothes, I wear different clothes, but the story is the same. Um, people who make it will make probably $100 a month in, uh, in Mexico or in Bangladesh or wherever the clothes are made. Um, and I'm sure it's true for many of the clothes that we wear. Um, the, the, the coal tan in my computer is made by people who make less than $100 a month. So this is all we know. All of that you can read it uh, everywhere if you study this. Um, but the the point in in the work that I try to make is to exhibit that even the people who or the industries that are trying to create awareness of these inequalities, or even more so, try to um, try to uh, level these inequalities, make it less equal, that these industries, by and large, there are many exceptions, but in general, if we talk about the rule and not about the exception, that in general, these other industries to create awareness, so NGOs and media and art, are functioning and reproducing the very same inequalities. That's not just something I do, I do it too but the industry at large also does it. There have been countless exhibitions in the Venice Biennial about labor conditions in impoverished places. Uh, there are fantastic works of art that have been made about that. In the end, they were then shown in Giardini or in some other place in Venice. And capital, intellectual capital, emotional capital, uh, of course financial capital, accumulates where? around the giardino or around the collectors or around the parties or around the universities. Little capital, if any, accumulates around the places where the content, like say the circumstances of, around which you could make a film in sweatshops in Bangladesh or in mines in Congo or in etc. Very little capital will accumulate in those places. So these inequalities are not simply about coltan or uh, labor, or uh, cocoa, or coffee, or palm oil, or rubber, or um, gold, or etc., etc. They are also about critical reflections about these inequalities. In the critical reflection, there's the same system in which in one place value is extracted, or raw commodities is extracted, could be an image of poor people, working in a factory, and in another part of the globe, capital is accumulated around that image. So whether it's an image of poor people, or whether it's a, whether, sorry, I'll retake that, whether it's an image of poor people producing cocoa here and eating chocolate here, or if it's just the industry of producing cocoa here and eating chocolate here, the same equalities exist in those two different value chains. So I try to exhibit that. That's all I try to do in Enjoy Poverty. I try to exhibit this. Um, because Enjoy Poverty, I mean, in the, in the film, you, you state uh, that poverty in Africa mm. is best as per image to the world from which Western society benefits. Yes. So you, use, you invite them to use their poverty as a, uh, and uh, a tool that can use uh, to make money. Yes. And uh, um, but we know that the, the film uh, uh, had very strong um, response, and uh, you were accused to be an opportunist or uh, even uh, using uh, your position to create kind of shock notoriety for yourself. Mm. How do you answer? Uh, about this kind of acquisition, or, I mean, no, it's not a good question. My question is more like, uh, uh, what do you think, uh, why the people had this kind of reaction from your point of view? Well, I'm not responsible for other people's well, reactions. Everybody can I react. Can touch you. I mean, they sure. use a judgment, so it's... Yeah. Um, again, I'm not responsible for other people's reaction, and everybody's entitled to her or his reaction. You know, um, it's not for me to judge other people's reactions. 
Everybody can think whatever they like. Um, I think it's a very good film. I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm serious. Um, um, I think it's a very good film because, not because of the cinematography or the this or the that. I think it's good because it really exhibits again how um, exactly what I what I try to do in a way. It exhibits how um, how systems of extraction operate. And we, I, I want to read a quote by um, Susan Sontag. Uh, you must know of Susan Sontag. She's a of course, it's a, it's a quote from this book. I will read it. I'll read it twice. It's a long, complicated quote. It's about sympathy. It's at the very end of the book. One of the last chapters, or maybe the last chapters. So here is Susan Sontag. So far as we feel sympathy, we feel we are not accomplices to what caused the suffering. Our sympathy proclaims our innocence as well as our impotence. To that extent, it can be, for all our good intentions, an impertinent, if not an inappropriate response. To set aside the sympathy we extend to others, beset by war and murderous politics, for a reflection on how our privileges are located on the same map as their suffering, and may, in ways we might prefer not to imagine, be linked to their suffering, as the wealth, as the wealth of some may imply the destitution of others, is a task for which the painful, stirring images supply only an initial spark. It's a very long, complicated sentence, so I'll pick out just a few sentences or fragments that I think it's good that I think are really uh, important. She, she says, we can feel sympathy if we see, see the suffering of, of others in war or in... Of course you feel for people who are suffering, who are dying maybe, who are in war or in cocoa plantations, for example. But there is a real risk in just feeling sympathy. The risk is that you will not see how your privileges, as a person who um, sees those images, how your privileges to just look at those images is located on the same map, is connected to the position of the people whom you look at. And maybe if you just feel sympathy, oh, there's a poor child, I feel sympathy, good. It proclaims your innocence, it's not my fault, and your impotence, I can't really help, it's just on the picture. So she says this is not good enough. These feelings of sympathy is maybe only the first, the very first step before we take next steps. And what should be the next step? The next step should be in to imagine or to study how your position, your privileges, is the word she uses. Your privileges as somebody who can not just drink a cup of coffee, but then also feel sympathy if you see a kid, a poor kid in Africa whose parents work on a cocoa plantation or on a coffee plantation and the kid has nothing to eat. You can feel sympathy. So you have the coffee and you have the image. You have the good taste and you have the sympathy. She says that's not enough. Because your privilege to look at the image and the suffering of the child from whom the picture has been taken is on the same map. They are not on a different world. They're in the same world. So she says just feeling sympathy in a way can be a smoke screen to not really understand how those two worlds are connected. So this was published in 2004. Um, it was, I was at that time starting to film Enjoy Poverty. I had already made episode one in Chechnya, but I think it kind of, I mean, I never spoke with her, she died soon after, but um, it, it, it feels very close to what I try to do, to locate my position as a coffee drinker, I drink coffee every day, and my position as a media consumer of war and inequality, I see it on pictures, on TV, um, uh, and, uh, and my position as an artist who wants to make art about how this all works. So I try to put all of that on the same map, and I try to do it in a brutally honest way. 
So if somebody asks me like, oh, will we see the film here? A guy in a refugee camp in Congo, he knows I'm there with the camera, the neon sign, enjoy poverty is up. I tell him, no, you will not see the film. It's clear, you will never see the film. He has no electricity, he has no TV, he has no iPhone. He will never see the film. Unless we create an exception to the status quo. The exception is, oh, let's start a cinema in the refugee camp. Sure, you can do that. But most refugee camps do not have cinemas. And also they won't show this film. They will show uh, Jackie Chan or Rambo or I don't know what, uh, some other shows. Um, so anyway, I try to make a, a portrait of the status quo, a portrait of how things and I try to be as brutally honest as I can. I give one example, another example is simply the neon enjoy poverty. You can say, oh, that's immoral, or that's ridiculous, or um, I don't think it's immoral. I think it's uh, exactly what it is. Consumers enjoy poverty, producers, that is people who own the image of poverty, I think this should be the people who are, for example, on this image, unfortunately, do not own that capital. And so within the film, there's like a faux emancipation program. It's faux because it's never going to work. It didn't work. In which I try to help people who, in my mind, should own poverty, because it's their poverty, uh, to help them like find benefits from it. And of course, that doesn't work. So it's kind of a... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a film about the contradictions of the circulation of capital, of images, and the position of art within all of that. And I think, I, I haven't seen any evidence that what I show in Enjoy Poverty is not true. I think it's still true. Now, the minute that it's no longer true, I think we should burn that film. But for now, I think it's still true. We don't want to burn anything piece of art, books. No, no, and, and, no yeah, many people no, want joking, to burn it. Course, many yeah. people want to burn it. <laughs> or they want to burn me, or whatever. Sure, it's good. If it's no longer true, let's burn it. But I think it's still true. But, um, Renzo, you said my position is I am an artist, uh, uh, white Western culture, and the Western culture artist, and uh, I'm interested in your position as an artist um, related to the part participatory project, because we see the film, but, I mean, film is one side of your work. The other work is with uh, the different situations, uh, Chechenia and uh, um, Congo and uh, other contexts. And uh, you, in 2010, you initiated uh, the Institute for Human Activities. Yes. And uh, um, you initiated, founded, but then what does it mean? Why it's important to say that it's kind of... You invented a lot of context. Uh, I mean, uh, the Art League of Congolese uh, workers and uh, uh, also this uh, institution. Uh, what, this, what, what the aim of this institution? And why, what is your position uh, as someone that is... Um, uh, kind of in initiator of something that should be developed in, uh, by theirself. Well, I, I didn't. Um, I, I didn't found uh, Cercle d'Art des Travailleurs de Plantation Congolaise. There's some discussion about it, but I really didn't. Maybe. Of course, CATPC founded itself. Um, um, I've been involved in it somehow because. Um, CATPC has been founded on a palm oil plantation where people make, I mentioned it yesterday, women make $9 a month and men make $18 a month. So you don't have a lot of time to like sit here at a table and discuss art. You're going to be worried about your kids surviving um, and, and trying to make some money left or right so you can buy medicine if the kid has malaria. Uh, so, yes, I was part of it in the way that I'm, because I'm Dutch, white, Western, etc., I can get money from the Dutch Art Council, and I say it's a Renzo Martins project, then they give me 50,000 euros, I give it to, to CATPC, and they can find, found CATPC. 
and they can pay everybody to be there and think and make some buildings and show. So in that way, um, I, the, 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 the tool was my white privilege, if you will, that I had to employ so that CATPC can be founded. Um, to start with, to just give everybody a daily salary so they can, they can spend the day thinking and talking and thinking about art rather than, if they want to, it's not an obligation, it's only for people who want to, of course, rather than uh, work for the amounts that I just mentioned. So um, that's the way I was part in it. I was just, uh, as an agent, somehow funneling money from the Netherlands to Lusanga which is only fair, it has nothing to do with white saviorism, in my mind, it's just making it equal again, because a lot more money was funneled from Lusanga to the Netherlands, much, much, much more than 50,000 euros, much more than a million, much more than 10 million. Hundreds of millions have been taken from Lusanga and have gone to the Netherlands and to the UK, um, if not billions, actually. So what I bring back is peanuts, nothing actually and so it's nothing it has nothing to do with in my mind with uh, um, handouts or it's just a small small restitution tiny restitution that's all it is of capital um, so why all these contexts well uh, after enjoy poverty um, because that was your question uh, after enjoy poverty um, yeah, it was, of course, uh, um, people saw it as a scandalous piece. Um, I don't think it's a scandalous piece. Again, I think it's a very proper, almost objective representation of power systems that are ongoing. Power systems between impoverished workers in Congo and the art world. How those two relate workers, refugees, uh, minings, journalists, how, how this value chain operates. That's what I try to do, and I think it's still valid. I mentioned that. Um, it's scandalous, maybe, because it's so, what I th like to think anyway, that it's brutally honest. I, I, don't, I don't hold back. I don't hold back in exhibiting how, excuse my French, how fucked up it is how deeply, deeply, deeply fucked up it is. And it's, again, it's ongoing. I, I'm very angry about it, and I'm very sad about it too. I'm very angry about it. Yeah. Uh, and then I needed to found institutions, because making one film is obviously not enough. Mm -hmm. Then you have a film. Where will the film be shown? Not on the plantations. Uh, it, will be sh it was shown in Kinshasa, sure. Where in Kinshasa? In places like this, where you know, middle class or wealthy people come together to discuss art, um, which is good, you know, I'm part of that, I love that, but uh, it's definitely um, not going to change labor conditions on plantations. Uh, for that you need more, you need institutions, you need funding, you need intelligence, you need, um, you need a lot more, and it can be done by one person. Many people need to do it together. Um, so that's why first uh, the Institute for Human Activities, we kind of made it shorter now, it's just called Human Activities, and later CATPC was founded in 2010 and 2014. And when I kind of invented the reverse gentrification program, which started in 2012, this is all what you saw in uh, White Cube yesterday. Um, yeah. It's not enough to just make critical art and then show it in wealthy places. That's the dominant model. You make critical art about how bad things are and you show it in wealthy places. It was also exactly what happened in Enjoy Poverty and what I already proclaim within Enjoy Poverty. Are we going to see it here? No. It's going to be in galleries and museums and maybe on TV in Europe. That's the way it is. You know, that's the way it is. I'm trying to be very honest about it. And now, of course, in the last 10 years, some things have changed a little bit. So now you can also see critical art, things like that, in uh, some global cities, in Kinshasa, in Lubumbashi, in Dakar, in Cape Town, in Sharjah, of course. Many things are changing a little bit. But I think on a structural level, 
it's, it hasn't changed that much. Renzo, to move from enjoy poverty to white cube, yeah. um, I would like to um, point out the moment that the, something that I can call um, the notion of failure. We mm. see you crying, yeah. and that it's quite an uh, important scene. Uh, you were trying to do something that you could uh, realize, uh, and uh, you felt the necessity to move, uh, to leave what you were trying to build, uh, and you went to uh, Losanga. And, uh, and I would like to ask you, related to what we were saying about your position, about the, the gaze, about the, the point of view, uh, about this um, failure, what does it mean? And uh, uh, I, I would like to think about the failure, um, thinking about an Italian philosopher that is Paolo Virno, about something, the error, uh, the, the mistake as a, an occasion uh, for creations. So I would like to invite you to, to think a bit about this uh, word, failure. Yeah. Well, I think it's central, <laughs> not just in that scene where I cry, yeah, yeah. but Enjoy Poverty is a portrait of the status quo, but also how art fails to do anything about it, how all my attempts to... It, it, it's a portrait, if you will, if you want to put it from that perspective, it is a portrait of a failure, of course. It's Enjoy Poverty already is, and, and episode is also. Their attempts to exhibit how, again, uh, how unequal, how fucked up it is, and how all the attempts to do something about this fucked upness are also failures. They are failures because they're not meant to succeed, often. NGOs are not really meant to... Um, make a more equal world. That's not their mandate. Businesses, of course, will always say that they're about uh, creating more jobs and lifting people out of poverty, but that's not really their mandate. Their mandate is to make profits. Photojournalists will always tell you that, um, that uh, somehow, miraculously, there will be more awareness, and then through more awareness, also the world will become better. We know it's not true. It doesn't work like that. Um, uh, and then artists, of course, ultimately will always say that, yes, they also have to make interesting pieces around it to critique the world and create alternatives for it. And we know that in most cases, that's not really true. It's not really what happens. So I exhibit all of that in the film Enjoy Poverty. Now, in White Cube, I try to take it a little bit more seriously. And also, I think I try to make an exception. I, I, I try to see, OK, we know that. Um, you can have interesting discussions, for example, here and now. Could the benefits of art, the benefits of critical engagement, the benefits, etc., etc., could they also take place not just in Tate Modern, funded by Unilever? Could it also be in a Unilever plantation from where the capital is extracted to fund Tate Modern? Let's see if it works there as well, possibly. Surely people are... Uh, equally smart, equally interested, and have probably a lot more urgency to do something and change things. So you see quite quickly in the film that it fails. And it fails for many reasons, you know. A big, a big reason why it fails is because I have, like, kind of ridiculous ideas. And it doesn't work. And, uh, and I'm blinded, in a way. And, uh, and I invite Richard Florida and, uh, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it could not work and, and the powers are much too powerful uh, luckily later on it, it yeah then I think it, it works a lot better um, and we are then able to create an exception to the rule that's to all it is huh? it's a tiny exception to the rule there's like 300 people I guess in and around Lusanga, who in one way or the other live of this project and who are planting all these trees. And it's really, I mean, I'm in love with the project. And many people are in love with the project. But if you go 10 kilometers further or to the next former Unilever plantation, it's still $9 a month for women and 18 for men. So it's just, uh, 
it's still a failure, even the fact that you can make an exception. And we talk about the exception. We shouldn't really talk about the exception. We should talk about the rule. The rule is $9 a month. So that's why I keep repeating it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I was quite, quite impressed by the, the moment in which you started to be in touch with the, the people, the workers. Mm. Um, and uh, there is this, uh, I mean, Lusanga, and uh, there, uh, there were uh, these uh, psychotherapists, uh, uh, the other white people, having this relationship that seems based on kind of um, pedagogy. So the, I'm wondering why, why uh, for you was important to have a psychotherapist uh, uh, addressing uh, uh, the, 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 the people uh, using the art as a, you know, a, as a, a therapy. And uh, I mean, that was a point that w for me was a bit tricky. Yes. Uh, why they, they could invent something by themselves using color or, you know, it happened later when you invite them to yeah. create this sculpture, but the first moment in which you um, enter in contact with them, it's like uh, um, something that is, yeah. there is a kind of hierarchy yeah. that I could recognize that point. No, I agree, and it's, um, it's, it's one of the reasons why it, 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 it failed, of course. I agree, it's one of the reasons why it failed. All of that, my presence, Richard Florida, those uh, psychotherapists. Um, yeah, I was delusional, I think. It was not good. Luckily, um, it was not good also because people um, in, in Bottega, I mean, surely they were interested in art a little bit, or, but they are, what really is at stake, as I understand, is that people want their land back. So, you know, if, and, and art and land somehow are of course uh, interconnected also, you know, Congo was stolen, it was military, there was a military occupation by the Belgians, but of course mostly by the companies that were given political cover by the Belgians, like Unilever, and they just stole the land and then they stole all the art and uh, it was like, um, and, and this is ongoing, the, the, the results are still there. Um, it is a colonial system still, obviously with now um, um, uh, Congolese people who are the president, but they, in, in an economic sense, um, not so much has changed, I'm afraid. And in the case of these plantations, they are directly uh, run from London. The guy that gave the co phone call, like, they need to get out. He's a guy in London. He's not somebody in Congo. Um, so people want their land back. And, um, and it was only when that kind of emerged that you see that all my ideas with, uh, you know, about creativity and trauma, this is all ridiculous somehow. There, there's something much bigger at stake than my silly project. So that's the failure. It, and um, in a way, I should be really happy that it failed because that was uh, a bad trajectory. And it feels very outdated also. It was filmed in 2013, I believe. Um, and already then it was outdated. I thought it was, I thought, I knew this guy, he said I'll come. I, I do like tsunamis and earthquakes and I can help. And I said, well, sure, come. Um, but I would not do that again, no. Uh, I, I would like to, um, uh, to, to I, I was thinking, uh, looking at the film, uh, uh, about what uh, the Senegalese economist and writer, uh, Felvin Sarr, in Afrotopia, affirms that uh, Africa need, needs to get, uh, to, to, to get right, to get right of the myth of progress and uh, the singular form of knowledge in order to open up space of Africa to rethink uh, itself and its future. Yes. 
Um, and this is for Feldin Sauer, it has to do with the economy, the idea that Africa has this informal economy uh, that is versus uh, the formal economy that is the, the Western economy. Uh, so I would like to, to, to ask you um, to say something about this relationship between formal and informal economy and uh, to go deeper in this idea of creating uh, a contest in which the people can live uh, uh, with the, the artwork and so the creation of the white cube. Yeah, I think it's, um, there are be uh, several types of economy at play. I think um, it's maybe important to state, first of all, that we're not in some random part of Africa. I'm not, I didn't go to some random village and say, hey guys, do you want to make art? Um, it's, um, there are several factors that, um, that make it specific. One of them that it's Lusanga and also Bottega, when we start where we started, have been part of the art world for at least a century, simply because they are Unilever plantations, and Unilever is a big sponsor of art. Um, Tate Modern, the Lady Lever Gallery, the Level Hume Foundation. If you are a brilliant academic in the UK, in the humanities, in art history, you teach at Oxford, you will get a grant from Lever Hume. And so it comes from plantations in Congo. So it's not some random place, some random village. It's people who have been uh, involved in this formal art economy in a way that has been denied, of course. You can't go to the Le Level Hume Foundation. They won't say this program is sponsored by plantation workers in Congo. They don't say that. But still, that's the truth of it. So. Um, so that's one important I issue. Another important issue is that um, many of the people who work on the plantations uh, have been um, conscripted, they have been forced to work there. Um, they, they, they didn't come voluntarily, they were forced to work there um, through violence, through oppression, through rape. Entire communities were forced to work on these plantations. So you can't formally call it slavery, but it's it's not very far from it. Now, some of the people, some of the peoples that were forced to, you know, work on the plantations, uh, have enormous, um, have left enormous heritages of art that you can find in uh, Western collections, mostly in Kinshasa also. But the, the, the like the most uh, prestigious pieces are in New York. They're in Brussels. They're in Berlin. They're in. Uh, they're in Frankfurt, they're in Paris, they're in Washington, D.C. That's where their art is. So it's not like people weren't making art. People were making art. Maybe they didn't call it that, but the things that now would be classified as art. Um, so th these are at least two factors in which um, uh, people are, have been part of these. Yeah. Um, now, I think the... the how it started out as these workshops and art sculptures and then the idea to reproduce it in Coco. They're, they're both, they're, they're at the crossroads, the intersection of um, a very horizontal type of economy, which is just people sitting together talking about their dreams, like, oh, what did you dream last night? Oh, I dreamt that my grandmother did. Oh, that's interesting. I, I'll make a drawing, and then this, and then that, and then, you know, a few minutes later, there's some sculptures. It's very fluid, and it's, yeah. And, and, and there are kids walking around, and if somebody doesn't feel like it, she doesn't come, and she comes the next day. It's close to an informal economy, if you will. Um, but then there's something very formal. That's the scanning. You make many pictures and then it becomes a digital file. These, so there's a horizontal structure and there's a completely vertical structure as well, which is to f you know, make sculpture, scan the sculptures and send them to London, basically. Or another very vertical thing is the white cube. Uh, it's very true. Some critics say, oh, the people in Lusanga certainly didn't tell you, Renzo, what we need is a white cube. No, they didn't. I said, 
I think it's a great idea to build a white cube, and I can explain you why I think it's a great idea. And then we got some famous architects of uh, uh, OMA to design it. Why? Because that's their specialty. Uh, they're very good at designing white cubes, and um, I mean, they're one of the best in the world. And, um, and we know that if you want to make a formal art economy, you need a good white cube. You can have one uh, in Venice, you can have one in uh, New York, in Dubai, in Cape Town, in Dakar. So if you want to be part of that economy, for it to bring back capital, that's the goal of the white cube. It's not to extract. Some white cubes are built on extraction. Others are about restitution. This white cube is about restitution of capital, of visibility, of legitimacy. That is what this white cube is for. The minute it doesn't do that job, it can be broken down. If anybody in Lusanga wants to break it down tomorrow, they can break it down. I'm fine with it, of course. It's not my white cube. I just restituted it. People in Lusanga and other plantations around the world have been funding all of our white cubes. So, let's give one to the people who actually built it, made it, financed it, and then see how, what, 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 it's time travel in a way. It's time travel. It's, um, it's, it, it, the, the white cube should never been invented, maybe. That is one option. Art was part of society in Congo and here also before, uh, uh, the aristocracies took over the world. Uh, art was part of everyday life for all the people. It was not something that was reserved to a certain class or to a certain education or a certain income or a certain skin color. Art was part of life for everybody. And now we have MTV or Netflix to take it over. Uh, so we don't have to make our own art, we can just consume it, you know. Prior to that, art was, of course, everywhere and for everybody. Um, so, in a way, we're trying to get back to that place, but with the technology and the means that are now here. So, one of them is the white cube, the other thing is scanning. And the most important thing, I think, is not even the white cube. I think the most important thing is that it... Um, um, uh, that with the income that the members of CATPC, so Mbuku Kimpala, Irene Kanga, uh, Mathieu Kassiyama, Papa Olele, um, uh, Ernest Kawata, um, uh, um, Siddhartha Masala, did I mention him? Yes. Um, you get uh, Kilamba, how they are uh, making uh, sculptures, performances, um, drawings, they're, making, they're starting to make fashion, it seems clothes, um, all kinds of things. And um, all of these works, first of all, function locally. They have continuous exhibitions. People come from Lusanga and other regions to look at their work, and then they discuss it. And they are vehicles of, of, um, of discussion, as art is elsewhere. But then also, it's exported digitally to Kitshasa, to other places and they make money with it. And uh, so there's now like 150,000 euros in profit from art, and they buy land with it. So um, this is another point of contention. Why do they buy land? The land is theirs. Yes, it's theirs. Historically, it was their land, of course. Before the Belgians came, it was their land. So why would you need to buy it? Well, this again, is the $9 and $18 a month story. If you take your land and you just say, it's mine, you'll get a, you get a bullet through your head. So the cheapest way to get your land back is to buy it. Any other type will cost you much, much, much more. And it's in a way easy because they make art. They can buy more land than they can, than they can cultivate at this point. So we buy land, CTPC buys land. I don't own land, but CTPC owns land. I don't want to own land. CETPC owns land. And then we find some funding to um, plant trees and uh, you know, make forests again, basically. All the forests were cut down for plantations. For the so th that's the most important thing, that, uh, something we like to, to call the post-plantation, something mm -hmm. 
beyond the plantation, which is basically just an egalitarian um, and inclusive and ecological new uh, society with art at its center, which is exactly what it was prior to colonialism and which is exactly the way all of our economies were prior to um, um, big powers taking over. So, uh, I would like to open up the, the floor to the questions that you have, that probably you have collected during this time. Um, yeah, Giorgio. Uh, uh, no, it's better to use the microphone because the people are following. So, uh, you question uh, the way you dress, you question the way uh, we dress. Uh, we could as well question the way you dress the image through the format, the montage, the selection of frames. Uh, we could question, for example, the, the idea and the scene where you cry. Why do, did you keep the scene? Why the sentimentality, the pathos? And of course, I'm not criticizing that. I'm, I'm only saying that there is a colonization of the gaze, of the imagination that happens through cinema. So cinema is a machine of colonization, sure. especially when you use pathos. So what I would like to ask is, why are you dressing like that? Why are you dressing the image like that? And what are you eventually addressing? Visibility or recognition? So. Um, I get everything except the last question. Visibility or recognition? Can yes. you elaborate on that? Yes. Because when I, when I say that there is a colonization of the image, yes. uh, for me, cinema has to do with the invisibility. And the idea that you have to keep the invisibility to produce cinema. Otherwise, you create an image that is for the market. I know that this project is for the market, but what I would like to say is that if you uh, create a visibility within the market that breaks the market because do not use, even, even within the market, you cannot use the same image of the market. I, will, I would like to make uh, an example, uh, a mainstream example. If you create a documentary about uh, um, the digital, you can break the digital through the way you use the montage, through the way, through the way you use the grammar of cinema. Whereas in this film, you use a very standard, normalized way of uh, putting the image together, linking the image together. Also, the way you, uh, the interviews are very normalized. It looks like a, a normal documentary. So for me, that is a, a Hollywood desk. That a, is? Uh, a Hollywood desk. Uh, a, um, let's say a, a colonization of the gaze, which happens to be uh, made thanks to Hollywood, or thanks to the uh, capitalized way of sure. making a film. Right. That's, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. So yes. that's a way I get it. I get it. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, the, of course, you, you point out correctly that um, um, the film, any film, is part of a machine and sometimes it is itself a machine. Um, I would be interested to know how you will appreciate the film that possibly you can see, if you like, uh, tonight, Enjoy Poverty, because that film is, um, I think, um, a dissection of that machine. It, it exhibits how a film made by a white man about very impoverished plantation workers in Congo, how that film is a machine and what goals that machine serves and what mach goals it does not serve. I think that film is a dissection, a, an analysis, if you will, of that machine. So it's not just giving us the images, okay, this is what we need to see. It's exhibiting how the machinery works. It's like a look into the machine room, if you will, the boiler room. 
So I would be interested how you see that. Um, the film White Cube is much more conventional. Uh, indeed, it uses the language uh, to some large degree of um, Netflix documentary, with people looking back, looking in the camera, uh, you know, talking about their emotions. Um, um, so I think, yes, you are right. We are, uh, the film is using, and I, as the person who ultimately has to sign off on the film, many people worked on it, but I'm the quote-unquote director. Um, um, we, we employ the tools of um, capitalized film, if you will. Um, I think um, I think we have to. I think for me, th there are different lines of thought. You could make um, anti-capitalist film in the way that you make the narration differently, that you uh, choose your characters differently, that you could, uh, and, and so in its form, it could be decolonizing, if you will. But I'm not so ultimately interested in finding a new cinematographic language, which could be decolonizing. Um, I doubt it really if it is, because I know that many of the people in Congo don't ever watch decolonized films. They watch very colonizing films. Um, the films they have access to and like are Hollywood films with very strong, simple narratives, with a problem, a hero, problem solved, you know, standard. Everybody in the world seems to like it. I don't know why, but everybody seems to like it. It's really magnificently organized. Um, what I'm ultimately interested in is not another cinematographic language. What I'm interested in is capital returning back to the people from whom it was taken away. And the film is simply a tool. And it's not even such a great tool, because if really we had a good Netflix-type camera people and, uh, um, and directors, especially, and uh, editors and a serious budget, then the film probably would have been much, much better. And it would have been a much better tool. But now it's like in the middle. It's like some parts of it are nicely filmed and some parts are like filmed in a terrible way, according to Netflix standards, right? But if I had the choice, I, my goal is not to create another type of cinema from with, with this film at least, from which would, um, through its language, decolonize. I'm much more interested in this being, if I would have the choice, I didn't have the choice, it would be a power tool, like a power drill or a power this, so a power tool to um, do what what it's meant to do, that is to bring back legitimacy and agency uh, and uh, visibility to uh, people from whom that has been stolen. Um, so that's, yeah, so I'm not anti-capitalist um, in the using the tools, the white cube, you can say it's a capitalist tool. I'm not against that. But the end goal is that the means of production go back to the people, of course. The end goal, and we're kind of on the way for it, is that CTPC owns its land, um, owns a white cube, um, uh, is starting to make films now that I'm not involved in, only for funding reasons I'm involved, um, and is planting forests again. That's the end goal. And if for that we use capitalist tools to go beyond capitalism and do something that is communally owned, uh, I'm completely in favor of that. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I'm in favor of it is because I think in, um, in, in, in much of the art that uh, speaks of itself as being decolonial, I don't think that in its actual operations, in its actual economic life, it is decolonial. I think it is, I think many uh, works of art talk about being decolonial, but in the f 
in the manner in which they stand in the world, so not what they say, but how they operate and where they operate and who has benefits from it, I think much art only, it's only a brand in a way. Or it, that's a risk, let's put it that way. There's a risk that it is reduced to being a brand, to a new fashion in a way. And that would be so sad because the world needs to be decolonized but not just the language, the actual land, the actual lives, the actual, indeed, ultimately, the actual narratives. I agree with that. Um, but I think we need accessible tools that everybody can understand to do it. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Um, so I don't want this to sound like a uh, like strong accusation, but in what you are saying, like I get the idea that you maybe don't really want to decolonize, but rather like uh, reinvent colonialism in a way that it helps the people that are colonized. So mm. it's not actually like decolonizing, but like finding a new type of colonialism that also helps the people like, and just because like, yeah, as you said, the white cube, you're not against it. You just want to use it like in a better way, but maybe wouldn't it be, have been better to like actually create a new like, uh, image or type like as you said that to you the white cube is like a symbol a portal to like for the people in the like in Congo to the western civilization and no I didn't say that no like you said it's a portal to the our like art uh, um, economy and uh, mm. yeah uh, but it, isn't that like just a new way of imposing um, Western? Mm. I understand the question. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. No, and you voiced it so well. Um, your question or your critique. I disagree with it, but um, you voiced it really well. Is it, are you not, if I may sum up what you said, and it's, it's a smart way of putting it, um, you're not trying to decolonize, you're trying to colonize, but in, in a way that it's beneficial for those who are being colonized. That's kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, um, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the elegance of how you phrased your proposition, so I have to smile a little bit about it. It's good. So congratulations. But of course, <laughs> Uh, but of course I strongly oppose uh, what you are saying. Um, it is true that I'm a white man, and it is true that I was just in Congo three days ago. Um, so all of that is true. It is also true that the white cube is a white cube. It's not something else. It's not a green cube or a, or a, or a purple bamboo uh, structure. Or you know, It's a white cube. That's exactly what it is quite bluntly. You know, it doesn't even pretend to be something else. Most white cubes, or many of them, are not actually white on the outside. They're only white on the inside. The outside can be anything, right? Here, it's really a white cube. There's no denying it's a white cube. Um, so yes, it's, um, it, it, it's a symbol. It's, it's a portal. That's the word I used yesterday. Not to Western civilization, but to a global network of white cubes that are also in Lubumbashi, also in Kinshasa, also in Cape Town, also in Dakar, also in Lagos, also in Magadish, also in Cairo, very important white cubes. If you look at the main curators who are dominant in um, bringing um, decolonial narratives into the world, the format and the main artists, the most important artists now, the format in which she or he or they exhibit are almost invariably white cubes. 
Where are these white cubes? They are almost invariably in rich places. Could be New York, obviously rich. Venice, you know, there are many poor people in Venice, I'm sure, but it's like a rich city. But even if it's in Kinshasa, it's in a rich area of Kinshasa where people with, you know, upper class access come. People who work in the street never go to white cubes, I'm telling you. So however decolonial one you want to be, they do not go there. They don't feel welcome. You can't come in if you're sweaty with a dirty shirt and no, have no shoes and you're hungry. What are you going to watch your decolonial art for? It doesn't exist. I've never seen it anyway, let's put it that way. So here we do try to do the exact opposite. So we die, try to do the exact opposite. We put this very white, white cube, the exact model that is used by all the dominant, most interesting, most successful artists within the decolonial discourses and curated. We put it right there at the place where the money was extracted from. That's where it stands, not somewhere else. It's not in Venice, it's not in Dakar, it's not in a rich area of Kinshasa, it's in Lusanga the forced labor plantations from which the money was taken to build white cubes in the UK. That's where it is. And the people who run the white cube are people who would previously never have had access to it. So I'm not saying this is, holds all the answers. Um, I'm just trying to create a level playing field. If all of the main critics, curators, artists who are involved in these projects, in decolonizing the art world, if they have access to the white cube, then I think that plantation workers, who again funded white cubes, should also have access to it. It's simple as that. It's simple as that. Now, I happen to be a white man. Maybe the project would be much, much, much better if somebody else would have done it. I agree. But I don't, nobody, I, I mean, I've never heard evidence of somebody doing it. So if somebody says, okay, I did it in 2008 already in this other plantation or in this other mine, or I mean, I rest my case much better, but I haven't seen it. So, um, and maybe they can pr live next to each other. Maybe we can exchange. There are um, uh, fantastic, I mean, the latest show now is done by, uh, at the White Cube, is done by this Ghanaian artist, Ibrahim Mahama. He was at the Venice Biennial. He's, a, he's one of the most important artists alive, I believe. Um, I'm very little compared to him. So I'm fine, of course. I, and I'm so proud that he wants to be, uh, that he wants to cover the White Cube in his dude bags. It makes the work much better. It's now a white cube covered in cocoa bags from Ghana. I mean, it can't get better than that, I believe. So my job is just almost like an agent to create a level playing field, and that's also what it is. Now, one aspect of colonization is that you colonize people, you occupy them, and you take away resources. I think that's why people colonized, right? Of course, there were stories about uh, religion and you know um, 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 uh, civilizations and you know all kinds of good quote unquote things, but the core of it was to extract resources and pay people a little bit here and make a lot of money there. That's kind of the core of it. That's why people did it to grab the land and resources and make profits not there but elsewhere. Now I think the opposite is happening here. Um, if we use quote-unquote colonial tools like colonial filmmaking with Netflix type of images or if we use colonial type um, uh, tools which is, could, could be a white cube that is very white, white, white cube, sure. But what it produces is something opposite to that. What it produces is land being back in the hands of the community. What it produces is sculptures by CATPC of which they take 100% of course of the benefits and it goes to them. Uh, what it produces is that people who would previously not be invited in Zoom calls with uh, people in New York or, uh, or, or, or Lubumbashi or being in those Zoom calls. What, what happens is that uh, agency and visibility can get into the hands. And I think again that I'm a tool for that. 
And of course, I use the tool. I'm this white guy, sure. Um, the minute I'm not uh, useful for this project anymore, then I should get out, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Exhaustive. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask something. Um, so uh, it's related to your reactions and uh, uh, it's concern uh, the future of the white cube. So what if the white cube will become um, will become um, will, will uh, become uh, a place in the network of the art system and art world. What if this place will be a place that attracts visitors from abroad and uh, so that the, the art world system will <laughs> run as in other places, as mm. in Venice, um, Kassel, etc. Yeah. What if, the, what, what is the aim of the white cube in the end? Yeah, I, I don't think the aim is to attract a lot of tourists. It's, it's really far from Kinshasa, it's 540 kilometers. The road is not so great. Um, I, I came back two days ago, from, drove from Lusanga to Kinshasa. So we rent a car, we don't, the project doesn't own a car. Uh, I don't own a car. Uh, so we rent a car, then of course the car breaks down. And then another car comes, it also breaks down. That's the reality of traveling in Congo. Uh, cars are old, they come after they, are not used anymore in, in Europe or in, in Asia, they go to Kinshasa. If they're not used anymore to Kinshasa, then they go to the provinces. So, uh, so we did, it took 20 hours to 540 kilometers um, of driving and waiting for a new car, etc. So I think tourism is not the best way to go. But there is going to be an online platform soon. Uh, it's going to be called White Cube Online. Um, and, and there is already now the website Human Activities, because I founded that in 2010, but soon there will be another website, White Cube Online. Um, and yeah, the White Cube is there to just do what White Cubes do. Uh, they, um, they perform all the functions of art, it performs all the functions of a museum. Um, so it's about beauty, it's about discussions, it's about um, opening new lines of thought, thinking about the past, the future, etc., etc. Uh, it's also about capital and visibility and about legitimization. That's what Richard Florida would say, and what every investor, uh, like uh, every investor, like Palazzo Grazzi, sure. Why is it? Of course, uh, the people that own it and run it love art, for sure but I'm sure that people also know that it's about capital and visibility and legitimization. We, I mean, that's simply a fact. And so that's the same for this white cube as well. But again, uh, it's, it's the end goal for the white cube is that it uh, legitimizes the position of the community who owns it. Yeah. And I don't think it's gonna be a big center like Kassel or Venice. Um, Simply because but it's there too. There is a risk. There is a risk. It no, it, 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 it's too inaccessible. Like, okay. um, before I, we built this uh, white cube, I had never, like, zero times in my life, heard of any curator coming to this zone. Even if I didn't create a history, right? The history is there. Everybody can read the history of the Unilever plantation and how they funded art and this and that. It's a huge surprise to me that then nobody who got a Leverhulme grant or nobody of the artists that exhibited in the Unilever series in Tate Modern, Tino Segal and Bruce Nauman and Ai Weiwei and uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera, I'm so surprised that none of them went to have a look to the place where the capital came from. These are very brilliant artists, like there's nothing wrong with their intelligence and their intuitions. And still, never, nobody, as far as I know, ever did that. So now there's a white cube and now sometimes a curator comes and that's great. So she or he can learn about the circumstances through which the Unilever series was funded. 
So if that's all it does, it's already good, but it will never be millions of people. And also it will never become that successful because it's too complicated. It's too complicated. The fact that I'm a white person really puts people off at this point, right? It, 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 because it's, it can be interpreted as neocolonialism or as white privilege or as this and that. And I understand all of these lectures. I'm not trying to defend myself. It, I understand it. It's fine. If people want to see it that way, that is, they are, of course, entitled to do that. I see it differently. Um, I think there's a global value chain from people extracted, labor extracted from plantations and mines, etc., etc. And then uh, there's uh, um, uh, products made like uh, Figueiro Rocher uh, cookies or whatever, uh, profits are made, um, um, and then uh, part of the profits is, are reinvested in museums. And in museums, an interesting critical artists can make pictures, paintings, drawings, films around the world. And around these museums, new economies emer emerge. This is what happens in Venice also. So that's the value chain. And we are simply trying to con reconnect the value chain from the plantations to the economies around the museums. And obviously, you need people from all the different positions in the value chain to work together. So you need people who are uh, working on plantations, and you need like hipsters. So I, oh, and you need artists, and you need real estate people, and you need people who have money because of the... And so anyway, if they all somehow bring together, then you can close the value chain, and the benefits of art can also accrue on the plantation, and not only in, again, places like Venice. So it's so simple in a way, but it's complicated because people don't like to look at the apparatus, at the machinery. People just like to look at the decolonial artwork that is doing the narration different and uses different words, and then it's good. But the machinery is the thing that counts, I believe. And we are talking about the machinery, and we are trying to close the gap that the machinery the dominant machinery from plantations to, in the end, economies around museums in rich cities, we're trying to close that gap. So we're talking about a machinery and not about, quote unquote, pretty art that, you know, signifies our impotence and our innocence, as uh, Susan Sontag just said. But it's also why it will never become so popular. It's always going to be a little bit, ooh, ooh, do you know, oh, oh, it's complicated, oh, yeah. Sure. So our time is over. Oh, really? But we will uh, have a last question for you. Sure. Uh, because the Congolese plantation workers are, uh, are working with you uh, on the uh, digital restitution of a work yes. a lot. So uh, I would like to know a bit about this and also about this uh, non-fungible token that I have to say, have to admit, I, I don't understand how yeah. does it function. And uh, I, will, I will invite uh, all the students and the people to, to go to the Renzo Martins website, to go to uh, Balot. Humanactivities.org. Uh, oh, sorry, human, um, human activities and then. Uh, dot to, org. Dot, dot org, and then uh, to go to Balo and then uh, see uh, the, um, the sixth uh, video. We don't have time to do this now, but uh, I ask you to watch this uh, video and then we will have occasion to discuss uh, more in the next lesson we will have next All week. the videos are really good. Actually. All the videos. So yeah. let's Six videos, yeah. This is... Uh, because everything I say, I learn it from other people. I mean, I just connect dots, but all the knowledge comes from other people. And in the six videos, uh, Mathieu Cassiama, whom you know from White Cube, and his colleague Cedar Tamassana, uh, uh, yeah, research the, the history of one particular sculpture. Uh, it's a sculpture that uh, represents a Belgian colonial agent. Uh, his name was Balot, and um, Mathieu uh, and um, Cedar are interested in this sculpture because. Um, 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 it, it's a sculpture that was meant to um, to resist forced labor on the Unilever plantations in Lusanga. 
um, in 1931, um, some colonial agents and some labor recruiters for the lever plantations were uh, uh, kidnapping women and then uh, like locking them up and also raping them um, to force the males, the men, to go work on the plantation. If they go work, then the women are liberated. If they don't go work, then, they are, then the women are kept hostage. And in the meantime, they are also being raped. So at some point, Cafucci, who was the wife um, of the, the, the chief uh, uh, Akelenge, uh, was raped. And um, yeah, this was like, that, that, was too, that, that was, of course, unacceptable, but unacceptable to such a degree that the community uh, killed this guy, Valo, this guy. And then they made a sculpture of him to contain his spirit. Again, this is not my knowledge. This is what I am just reproducing from other people who I have heard speaking about it. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, Professor Sikitele, who uh, came to do a lecture in Lusanga. Uh, before the white cube was there, there was already a bamboo structure. He gave a big lecture on the revolt of the Pende, so on these events in 1971, uh, sorry, 31. Um, and so the sculpture was made to contain the spirit of this Balo guy, um, so that he could no longer rape and steal and kill. Even his spirit could no longer rape and steal and kill. And the sculpture um, didn't really succeed because, of course, the plantation regime continued up to today, as I pointed out. Again, $9 a month if you are a woman and you work on these plantations. Um, um, so that didn't really work out that much. And the sculpture is now in a museum in the United States. It was so, uh, bought by an American collector. He's in video number five. Uh, he bought the sculpture and it's now in the museum. And so CATPC, Mathieu and uh, Cédar went to the museum and asked for a loan of the sculpture to get it temporarily back <coughs> in order to reconnect with the properties of the sculpture, with the power of the sculpture, with what it can do, what it can mean for the community to reconnect to these legacies of resistance against the colonial empire. Um, and the museum has... Um, they haven't said no, but they always said, oh, maybe later, let's see this, that. Uh, so that's another way of saying no, I guess. <coughs> and now, of course, as you know, since the last year and a half, there's all these NFTs. And what are NFTs? It's a way to just say, in the digital sphere, this is mine. That's what an NFT is, it's a non-fungible token. You can claim anything. Uh, Hitor Steyl, the artist, has made an NFT of uh, the Bundeskulturhalle and of the RCA, the Royal College of Art in London. She made an NFT of it and said, it's mine. You can just do that. You can make an NFT of, the, of anything you like because it's an uncharted territory. It's like a new <clears throat> layer around the world that nobody knows what the rules are going to be. Um, it's a new space that's going to be colonized, of course. And who colonizes? The people who have the power to colonize. So here I perform my role as an agent again. I <clears throat> know that the museum is not saying yes to say at the PC, and I learn about uh, how these NFTs operate, and then we make a plan. And it needs people from those different positions in those this global value chain, and then the plan comes together. So at CATPC made... Uh, an NFT of the Balo sculpture just based on the pictures of the website of, um, of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts uh, because that's the only thing they have access to. Um, they don't get a loan. Uh, the museum travels, sorry, the sculpture travels from one museum to the next. CTPC says, hey, we have a white cube. It's good. We have climate control. We have everything. It's designed by OMA. It's legitimate. Nevertheless, they said no. So now the NFT is a way to just claim ownership over the sculpture. And the next step is to make many NFTs, 300, and sell them. So every piece 
Every little Balo NFT that's going to be sold is a part of the spirit of Balo that is going to be controlled by the people. Because money comes back, and with the money you can buy land and plant forests, feed the children, help the elderly, etc., whatever the community wants to do. Um, so it's just a way to use this new NFT technology to redistribute um, capital and power. That's what the whole project is about. I think Enjoy Poverty was an analysis of the pro project, and White Cube is the beginning, the first steps in an attempt to use power and capital. Yes, they can be capitalist, money is capitalist, um, but still use money, uh, power and capital for a more uh, equal world. Yeah. Renzo, grazie. Grazie a lei. Thank you very much for your generosity. We, we have a lot of matter that we could discuss in the next lesson together. And uh, we will keep with us uh, questions uh, and uh, inquiries. And uh, so I thank you very much. Thank I thank, you. I thank uh, very much Silvia Lucchesi and um, Francesca Colasante, Teatrino di Palazzo Grassi, Palazzo Grassi and Schermo dell'Arte for making this possible. And uh, uh, thank you again. Thank Ciao. you. It's a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank uh, you. Be so patient. Thank you. Bye.